Namaste. Well, here we are on a rainy, drippy Saturday morning, <laughs> passing the time, and not only passing the time, but enjoying the time by meditation on the heart. Now, you will read in many different spiritual books and teachings and traditions, and you'll hear from many preachers and so on about the Lord in the heart or God in the heart or love of God in the heart. And most of them have it all backwards. <laughs> You know, we've been talking in this series on Brihadar and Yakapanishad about the different states of consciousness. And of course, I'm going to put up the good old diagram of the four states of consciousness because this is our foundation. This is our guiding light. This is our viewpoint, both literally and figuratively. We see the world through consciousness. We don't see it directly. Consciousness is an instrument by which the awareness of the self can actually see and interact with the material world. Now, when you look at the world or when you look at life or when you just look, period, through consciousness as the center of everything. Everything looks different than if you look at things, you know, as material objects being real and so on like that. It's just a question of whether your point of view is centered in Jagrat consciousness, Svapna consciousness, Sushupti consciousness, or Turiya. Now, of course, as a student of Advaita, we do our best to center ourselves and view things from Turiya consciousness. But actually, all the states of consciousness are operating all the time. We just have to put them in their proper perspective. What does that mean? Turiya is the center. Turiya is the root, the source of everything. And then next to Turiya is Sushupti, deep sleep, consciousness, consciousness of the void. Then there's Svapna, consciousness of the mind and thoughts. And finally, good old Jagrat, consciousness of so many objects in the material world through the senses. So now most people in this world are centered on Jagrat consciousness, isn't it? They look at things from the point of view that this world is real, I am this body, the senses are giving me accurate information about reality, <laughs> and so on. Dreams are just illusions. And of course, in deep sleep, there's nothing. And Turiya? Whoever heard of it? So this is really sad because these higher states of consciousness, Svapna, Sushupti, and Turiya, are actually where the human potential for self-realization lie. How is that? Well, as we have seen in our study of the Upanishads so far, without the clue or the revelation of the Upanishads, the Vedic scriptures, nobody would ever guess that the Supreme is Brahman and that Brahman, at least from the point of view of Jagrat consciousness, is located in the heart. Who would guess? Now, it's true, like I mentioned in the beginning, many spiritual and religious teachings talk about God in the heart. And it's very interesting because they almost get it right. <laughs> For example, they say, 
the soul is present in the heart. Unfortunately, the idea of the soul goes along with the concept of eternal individuality, that we are always different from God. And this is duality. And in the viewpoint or from the viewpoint of duality, we can't realize the self. We can't realize that the self is actually Brahman because we mistake it for you know, the soul and think that it has an eternal individuality. But this is wrong because what happens to the individual's identity at the time of death? when the being transmigrates from one body to another. Now, we're going to go into this in great detail in a future series. But right now, we can understand that the identity, my name is so-and-so, this is my body, this is my family, my country, my job, my house, my car, this and that, huh? all of this ends at death. That identity is finished. And maybe one takes only some impressions that were gathered throughout this lifetime and then goes to the next body, goes to the next life. So that identity is finished and a new identity is born along with the next body and so on. And identity can change. For example, I was born in a Christian family, and I considered myself a Christian up until the time I was 13 or 14. Then I started to doubt. Then I went through a period of exploration where I looked into many different spiritual paths. And I came to the conclusion after many years of searching that this Advaita teaching is the highest. Why? Because it explains everything. For example, it shouldn't be any surprise that the material world is structured in a similar way to the four states of consciousness. Well, how is that? The earth is like Jagrat. It's full of so many apparently, <laughs> apparently solid objects, huh? as it were, uh, which is a phrase used in translations of Sanskrit, especially the Upanishads, to indicate an illusory perception. The world apparently, or as it were, consists of many, many solid objects, many real objects, so-called real objects. Uh, and then there's the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is like Svapna. And there can be clouds in the atmosphere, and those are like thoughts. If there's too many clouds, they obscure the sun and the clarity is lost. And that's just like what happens when the mind is full of too many thoughts and we cannot see the reality. What is the reality? Well, after the atmosphere, there's space. Space is like Sushupti consciousness. It's just blank, empty, frictionless, unattached uninfluenced by anything. This is exactly like Sushupti consciousness. And finally, we have the sun, which is like Brahman, Turiya, because it lights up everything, makes everything visible, puts everything in its proper perspective, and so on. So now, I'm not talking about the material model of the reality or solar system or anything. I'm talking about a model where the reality is viewed as an analog, as a metaphor of consciousness. Because certainly without consciousness, we wouldn't be aware of any of this stuff. So everything is reflected in consciousness. 
And because it's reflected in consciousness, it takes on some of the qualities or the structure of consciousness. That's not at all surprising to me. Huh? It's not surprising that we can find an analog to Jagrat consciousness in the earth, in the biosphere, and an analog to Svapna consciousness in the atmosphere, and an analog to Sushupti consciousness in space, and to Brahman in the sun. I mean, the sun is compared to God and Brahman in so many scriptures. And then also when we look the other way, when we look within, we see the senses and the body as the external, jagrat. And then we see the mind where the impressions from the senses and, and thoughts and so on show up. Then when we go deeper, we find sushupti, which is nothing. And if we persist and go even deeper, we find turiya, which is everything. <laughs> Brahman, the source, the ground of being, the unlimited, unconditioned existence and awareness, full of bliss. I mean, Sushupti is already blissful, but it is not bliss itself. It is not the source of bliss. Sushupti is blissful because there's no suffering. There's no impressions, there's no changes, there's no actions, and so on. But Brahman is blissful because that is its nature. So anyway, if we want to see the world like this, if we want to view the world from the viewpoint of consciousness, we should not try to meditate on the mind on the third eye, the Ajna Chakra. Ajna means not knowing. The mind is like full of doubts, always. The mind is always taking every little thing as a possible threat to its existence, isn't it? Any little change, any little movement, and it sounds the alarm. <laughs> Hey, intelligence, hey, there's something going on here. Then the intelligence has to review it and see, is this really a threat? To get beyond the mind, to actually turn off all these alarms. You know, it's like all those alerts on your phone. If you go in and turn them all off, you don't really miss anything because every once in a while you just go and check and see, you know? But... What happens is they don't annoy you, they don't disturb you, they don't interrupt you anymore. So in the same way, when you turn off the mind, when you stop listening to the mind's panicking alerts and doubts and questions and so on, and you go deeper, then you find the bliss of Sushupti. And if you go even deeper, the real bliss of Brahman is there. And the gateway to all this is in the heart. Why is that? Because the intelligence is seated in the heart. This is described in the scriptures. The heart is the source of all the life's energy. And in fact, it's interesting. Uh, I was talking earlier about the soul. Well, the English word soul is a translation of the Greek word pneuma or pneumos in the masculine. So this word means air, as in the word pneumatic. So the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, knew about the bodily airs. They knew about prana. They all, you know, the ancient Greek philosophers all had Brahman teachers. Plato and Aristotle and, and many, many others. So they got a lot of knowledge from the Vedic tradition. But when the Romans took over, 
the Roman Empire cut off the source. And they portrayed this wisdom as originating in Greece, but it didn't. It originated in India and it was exported to Greece through the trade routes, the spice trade and so on, the salt trade with India. So these ideas have been around for a long time that prana is sometimes viewed as the soul or as the being, as the sign of life for sure, because when life is over, the breathing stops. No more prana, apana, udana, samana, avana. The pranas are viewed as identical with life, consciousness, and the spirit. But actually, of course, they're simply a symptom of the presence of the spirit. The presence of Brahman in the heart. And when Brahman leaves the heart at the time of death, the body falls down, useless. No one can revive a dead body. Once the pneuma, huh, the life heirs, leave, death follows surely and certainly in a very short time. It's very interesting. If one is deprived of food, within a few days or weeks, it causes death. But if one is deprived of air, it causes death in a couple of minutes. So the air and breathing has always been identified with the soul, but it's not the soul. It's only a symptom of the presence of Brahman. So this confusion has come down in Western religion and philosophy and caused tremendous suffering and ignorance because well, first of all, it's not the original understanding. And even in the original understanding, uh, there are Vedic sects, uh, yogic sects in particular, that view prana as the supreme. In fact, there are mantras in the four Vedas that worship prana as the supreme. Well, there's nothing wrong in this. Just like sometimes we see the mind as the supreme, or consciousness as the supreme. But all these are simply symptoms of the presence of Brahman in the body, in the heart specifically. So when we meditate on the heart, we can access this view, which is based on consciousness. And if we know the four states of consciousness, their symptoms, qualities, and so on, we can easily see where a certain thing is coming from, whether it's a symptom of Jagrat, Svapna, Sushupti, or Turiya. And this, of course, is very valuable for self-realization. When we see, for example, God, there's many religious traditions that try to see God in the heart. Whether we think of God as simply pure consciousness or as a being with form, name and form and so on, still Brahman is the basis for all that. And because Brahman is present in the heart as the intelligence, it's another symptom. The intelligence is very useful to distinguish one thing from another. That's its function discrimination. So by using the intelligence to distinguish the different states of consciousness, their functions, symptoms, qualities, and so on, we arrive at a completely different view of the world, a consciousness-centric view. This is the Vedic view. This is the underlying structure that all the Vedas and their corollary literatures are based on. So we should adopt this view instead of like the scientific or heliocentric or personality of Godhead view or, you know, any of the different views that are available through different spiritual traditions or material traditions too, like science. 
because in the ultimate issue, the consciousness of you is the one that's the most accurate. And it explains the most about not the world as an object, uh, because there is no object. There's only the subject. So we take the subjective view based on consciousness as the meaning of everything. And that automatically leads in meditation from the heart to Brahman. And that is the pinnacle of self-realization. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.